Since we've uh, made a couple of changes to the program to accommodate uh, our late, late uh, breaking abstracts, we're going to move quickly to our plenary talk today. Uh, this is a talk that uh, Dr. Melinda Telly, who's Associate Professor at Stanford University, is going to give us. Dr. Telly is a translational, tra translational scientist, and her expertise is in triple negative breast cancer. So the uh, plenary talk uh, this year is on recent advances in triple negative breast cancer. Melinda. Thanks, Virginia. And uh, hello, everyone. It is my honor to give this plenary lecture on recent advances in triple negative breast cancer. And I'd like to thank the scientific committee for the opportunity to speak today. <clears throat> Here are my disclosures. When I think about advances made in the treatment of triple negative breast cancer, I find that my mind often goes back to the days when I first started in this field. And while I've often felt that progress hasn't happened fast enough, sometimes I'll think back to a specific patient who highlights just how far we've come. This is Sumita, and when she was 33 years old, breastfeeding her second daughter, she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. The tumor was locally advanced, and she also was found to have a germline BRCA1 mutation. This was 2007. She started preoperative therapy with an anthracycline and taxane-based regimen and had minimal response to treatment. We were concerned. She went to surgery and had significant residual disease. Based on emerging data at that time, she did go on to receive platinum-based adjuvant therapy, and I'm happy to say that she is alive and well today, working as a teacher, raising her family, and very much looking forward to turning 50 next year. For patients like Sumita diagnosed today, however, the standard of care has changed substantially. We now have the routine use of carboplatin, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, as well as PARP inhibitors. So this is where we were back then. Our adjuvant therapy consisted of anthracycline and taxane-based combinations. We had other cytotoxic agents, of course, but their selective use and targeting for triple negative breast cancer wasn't optimized. There were no approved targeted therapies, and for metastatic disease, there was really no clear treatment standard. Survival after relapse was short at 12 to 18 months. And this is what we've achieved since that time in the treatment of early stage triple negative breast cancer. We showed that adjuvant capecitabine improves disease-free and overall survival, that pembrolizumab's addition to neoadjuvant chemotherapy improves event-free survival. For our patients with germline BRCA mutations like Sumita, adjuvant olaparib was shown to improve disease-free and overall survival. And finally, the addition of carboplatin to neoadjuvant anthracycline and taxane-based treatment was also shown to improve disease-free and overall survival. There have been many notable achievements as well in advanced triple negative breast cancer. Again, for our patients with germline BRCA mutations and advanced breast cancer, the PARP inhibitors olaparib and telazoparib were shown to improve progression-free survival. Pembrolizumab added to first-line chemotherapy was also shown to improve progression-free and overall survival in pdl one positive advanced triple negative breast cancer. We then saw the entry of antibody drug conjugates with sasituzumab jovatecan showing improved progression-free and overall survival for pretreated patients with advanced triple negative disease. And finally, Another ADC, trastuzumab deruxtecan, showing improved progression-free and overall survival 
this time for pretreated advanced HER2 low breast cancer, which includes triple negative disease. So I want to walk you through how we got here. More than 20 years ago, Peru and Sorley famously described the intrinsic subtypes of breast cancer. They described one subtype, the basal-like subtype, that had gene expression very similar to the pattern seen in the basal epithelial cells of the normal breast. These tumors were noted to be frequently hormone receptor negative and HER2 negative. And it was around 2005 that the term triple negative breast cancer first entered the breast cancer lexicon to describe those tumors that were estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HER2 negative. Many early studies went on to describe the clinical features and epidemiology of triple negative breast cancer. And we learned that triple negative tumors have a higher rate of early recurrence are more likely to have visceral spread at the time of first relapse, and are overrepresented in women of African ancestry, particularly those who are premenopausal. One early observation that ultimately proved important therapeutically was this association between triple negative breast cancer, the basal-like subtype, and germline pathogenic variants in BRCA1. It was noted that for carriers of BRCA1 mutations, their breast cancers were very commonly both triple negative and basal-like. This was important because a few years later, in 2005, two papers were published in Nature showing that BRCA1 and 2 deficient cells are markedly sensitive to inhibition of the PARP1 enzyme. PARP1 is important in single-strand DNA break repair, and so the hypothesis was that if you lose single-strand break repair through chemical inhibition of PARP1, and you've lost efficient homologous recombination or double-strand break repair due to BRCA mutation, that this would result in a synthetic lethal interaction and profound cytotoxicity. This, of course, was the data that launched the clinical development of PARP inhibitors and also the era of targeted therapeutics for hereditary breast cancer patients that ultimately, again, was very significant for triple negative breast cancer. And it was in 2009 and 2010 when early reports demonstrated proof of concept for targeting DNA repair defects in breast cancers associated with germline BRCA1 or 2 pathogenic variants, including the DNA-damaging chemotherapeutic agent cisplatin, as well as oral PARP inhibitors. And these early data led to a number of questions about whether targeting DNA repair defects could have a role beyond germline BRCA1 and 2 to help patients with sporadic triple negative breast cancer more generally. We knew that tumors arising in BRCA mutation carriers were really characterized by defects and homologous recombination. And a number of groups set out and ultimately demonstrated that HR deficiency is also implicated in sporadic, sporadic breast tumors with mechanisms including methylation, germline mutation in other homologous recombination pathway genes, somatic mutations including somatic mutation in BRCA1 and 2, as well as other mechanisms. And there was a lot of work that went into the development of various homologous recombination deficiency biomarkers to better describe this biology. This concept was first evaluated in the phase three TNT trial. This was a trial in triple negative and BRCA 1-2 mutation associated advanced breast cancer where patients were treated with either carboplatin or docetaxel as first line treatment. This study showed that carboplatin resulted in a higher rate of objective response for patients with germline BRCA mutations as well as somatic mutation. Unfortunately, HRD biomarkers could not identify a separate group of patients more likely to benefit from platinum in this study. 
But it was just a few years later in 2018 that we saw the two PARP inhibitors approved for the treatment of advanced breast cancer with a germline BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Olaparib in the Olympiad trial and talizoparib in the Embraca study improved progression-free survival compared to standard chemotherapy. And this was clinically meaningful. With that data in the advanced disease setting, the next question was to look at PARP inhibitors in the high-risk adjuvant setting for patients with germline BRCA1 or 2 mutations. And the Olympia study was really a tremendous worldwide effort where more than 1,800 patients were ultimately randomized to receive one year of olaparib or placebo. One year of adjuvant olaparib resulted in improved invasive disease-free survival, improved distant disease-free survival, and ultimately this study went on to show an overall survival benefit for adjuvant olaparib, leading to its FDA approval in the U.S. If you look at the type of first invasive disease-free survival event, it was noted that those patients treated with one year of adjuvant olaparib had fewer non-breast cancers diagnosed during the follow-up period. This provided a hint of a potential prevention benefit that had long been hypothesized. And in parallel to all of this, there were a number of phase two and three neoadjuvant studies in patients with early stage triple negative breast cancer to evaluate carboplatin added to anthracycline and taxane based chemotherapy. For the most part, these studies showed an improvement in the rate of pathologic complete response with addition of carboplatin with somewhat differing results in terms of long term outcome. None of these studies were appropriately powered for those long-term outcomes. At this meeting last year, we saw important data from a clinical trial from the Tata Memorial Center. So it was a randomized phase three clinical trial for early stage triple negative breast cancer. Patients were treated with paclitaxel followed by anthracycline and cyclophosphamide and were randomized to receive carboplatin or not. In this study, the addition of carboplatin led to an improvement in event-free and overall survival that was particularly marked in those patients who were young, less than 50, and premenopausal. The NRG-BR003 trial is assessing this strategy in the adjuvant setting and has yet to report. But there have also been efforts to advance non-anthracycline, taxane, and platinum-based regimens as standalone treatments for early-stage triple-negative breast cancer. And the results of the NEOSTOP trial showed very provocative rates of pathologic complete response and overall more favorable safety and tolerability to an anthracycline-containing four-drug regimen. But carboplatin was not the only drug whose use um, found um, a new role in the treatment of early stage triple negative breast cancer. The CREATE-X study was an important trial that evaluated the use of adjuvant capecitabine for patients who had received neoadjuvant chemotherapy and had residual disease. For the subset of patients with triple negative breast cancer, there was a significant improvement in both disease-free and overall survival with adjuvant capecitabine, leading to a change in the standard of care. Moving to the next big area, we know that in the last decade, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies targeting PD-1 and PDL one have had huge clinical impact across many areas in oncology. And early on, there was concern that breast cancers were not particularly immunogenic. But ultimately, combination strategies were advanced with the goal of trying to make these tumors more immunogenic so that they could then benefit from the immune checkpoint blockade. 
and it was around 2013 and 2014 that a number of studies documented the importance of enrichment of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in triple negative breast cancer and the favorable prognosis that they convey. There were also studies looking at PDL1 expression showing that it is increased in triple negative compared to non triple negative tumors. Keynote 355 was ultimately one of several randomized phase three trials to evaluate a checkpoint inhibitor combined with chemotherapy in the first line treatment of metastatic triple negative breast cancer. In this study, patients had untreated locally recurrent or metastatic triple negative breast cancer and were randomized to receive chemotherapy with pembrolizumab or chemotherapy with placebo. Ultimately, the study showed that for a subgroup of patients, approximately 40% with PDL1 positive tumors, the addition of pembrolizumab improved progression free survival and also had a significant impact on overall survival with a median uh, gain of approximately seven months. This led to the FDA approval of pembrolizumab with chemotherapy, and this has become a first-line standard. But when pembrolizumab got its full approval for advanced triple-negative breast cancer, at the same time, it also became the first checkpoint inhibitor to be indicated for the treatment of early-stage triple-negative breast cancer. Keynote 522 was a landmark study. And this study enrolled patients with stage two or three triple negative breast cancer. And patients were treated with paclitaxel and carboplatin followed by an anthracycline and cyclophosphamide with either pembrolizumab or placebo during the neoadjuvant phase. And then after surgery, this blinded treatment was continued for up to nine cycles. In this study, we saw that there was an improvement in the rate of pathologic complete response with the addition of pembrolizumab, and that benefits were seen regardless of PDL1 status. But most notable was the impact that pembrolizumab had on event free survival. We recently saw updated data with a median follow up of more than five years showing a very clear benefit in terms of event-free survival of approximately nine percentage points. This um, is truly a remarkable result, and um, I feel that we can see this impact in the clinic. Unfortunately, immune-mediated adverse events are a reality, and in this trial, of curative patients, approximately 15% had grade three or higher adverse events, and this is important as some of these toxicities can be lifelong. So what's next for immune checkpoint inhibitors in early stage triple negative breast cancer? I think the Keynote 522 trial um, has been great. It's raised a lot of new questions. Um, one of the big ones is whether there's any role for adjuvant use of an immune checkpoint inhibitor. We saw in the Gepar Nuevo study that long-term outcomes were comparable to Keynote 522, and that trial did not use adjuvant checkpoint inhibitor therapy. We also saw earlier at this meeting that the Alexandra trial did not demonstrate a benefit for adjuvant chemotherapy with checkpoint inhibitor. Newly launched from the Alliance is the Optimus PCR clinical trial, which will directly ask this question in patients with triple negative breast cancer who achieve a pathologic complete response to their neoadjuvant therapy. And also the results of SWOG 1418 are eagerly awaited. The next big question relates to the chemotherapy backbone. Do all patients need an anthracycline, taxane, and platinum-based regimen? 
And the newly launched uh, trial Scarlet from the Southwest Oncology Group will assess non-inferiority of a taxane platinum with pembrolizumab-based combination. And finally, uh, can we identify better biomarkers for benefit uh, of both benefit and toxicity? This is a really important area, and uh, certainly a lot of work is happening in this space. The last uh, area that I want to cover is the introduction of antibody drug conjugates into the treatment landscape for advanced triple negative breast cancer. The first drug that entered was sasituzumab jovatecan, and this is a monoclonal antibody directed against trope 2, and this is a common epithelial antigen that's highly expressed on many solid tumors, including triple negative breast cancer. This antibody is linked to SN38, which is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload, and as you can see, there's a very high drug-to-antibody ratio. Sasituzumab jovatecan was evaluated in the phase three ASCEND trial where patients who were pretreated, they had two or more chemotherapies for advanced triple negative breast cancer were eligible and randomized to sasituzumab jovatecan or treatment of physician's choice. Sasituzumab jovatecan showed very clear benefit that was important in both in terms of um, progression-free and overall survival. And as you can see, there was a very nice objective response rate in patients who were heavily pretreated. This drug received a full FDA approval in the United States in April of 2021. And while this compound is different in design compared to standard chemotherapy from the patient perspective, it feels very much like chemotherapy with myelosuppression, GI toxicity, as well as alopecia all being common. The next agent that was introduced was trastuzumab deruxtecan, or TDXD, this time for the treatment of advanced HER2 low breast cancer. TDXD is a monoclonal antibody that um, is directed towards HER2, and this is linked, again, to a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor payload, and as you can see, it has a very similar drug-to-antibody ratio. Destiny Breast 04 was a landmark study and really the first to demonstrate the activity of a HER2-targeted antibody drug conjugate outside of classically HER2-amplified disease. For this uh, trial, patients had advanced HER2-low breast cancer. This was defined as a HER2-IHC score of 1 plus or 2 plus with the amp absence of amplification and patients were treated with one or two prior lines in the metastatic setting. They were randomized to TDXD, or treatment of physician's choice. The study had only a very small population of patients with hormone receptor negative or essentially triple negative breast cancer. But these are the exploratory endpoints from that subset. You can see that there was an improvement in progression-free and overall survival with TDXD compared to chemotherapy. And these findings were very much in line with the results in the overall cohort. There was also a much higher confirmed rate of objective response at approximately 50%. And for this reason, the FDA approved this therapy in August of 2022 for advanced her too low breast cancer and included patients uh, with hormone receptor negative or triple negative disease. So what's next in the antibody drug conjugate space for triple negative breast cancer? As we've heard a lot at this meeting, there are many new agents in clinical development. I think we urgently need to understand the optimal sequence, certainly need to diversify our antibody targets and payloads, and I believe that as more and more of these agents show high-level clinical activity, ultimately safety and tolerability will win the day. 
And so to conclude, real progress has been made in triple negative breast cancer. If we look at this through the lens of drug approvals, all have come in the last five years. In the next five to 10 years, I believe many more will come. And while this talk has really focused on advances in triple negative breast cancer, I want to acknowledge that many more important hypotheses were tested and ultimately not advanced. But there were valuable lessons learned, nonetheless, from these investigations. I think the story of triple negative breast cancer is a wonderful example of how a field can advance when focused. And contributions came from all over the world, really highlighting the importance of collaboration in science. And as we look to the future, I think while we've gotten off to a somewhat stuttering start, I believe that circulating tumor DNA, minimal residual disease detection, holds incredible promise to help optimize therapy in early stage triple negative breast cancer. It's gonna help us avoid overtreatment and better identify those at highest risk. We need to partner and bring these designs to the forefront. For metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we need to keep seeking curative therapeutic strategies. This has proven elusive so far, and while survival has improved, it's simply not good enough. And finally, for all of you in the audience who are new to breast cancer research, there's enormous opportunity to contribute to a better future for all affected by triple negative breast cancer. The potential for clinical impact is real, and patients are depending on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Telly. This concludes our session. The next session is starting now uh, at uh, Stars at Night Ballroom 1 and 2, and it's late-breaking abstracts. Thank you. <laughs>